we're going to continue talking about Euler angles and get into how you write the rigid body kinematic differential equation written in terms of the Euler angles. You could write a set of ODEs for the Euler angles and how they change as a function of the angular velocity vector. But before we get into that, these are the notes from last time, just to familiarize you. First, we talked about this C matrix, right? The rotation matrix that relates your, your body fixed frame, blue, I usually use blue, compared to some other reference frame, usually an inertial frame, and you want to right? What's the orientation of this triad of unit vectors with respect to this other triad? So the, the kind of straightforward way to do that would be a, a C matrix. But we learned another way uh, to write that in terms of the Euler angles. Uh, I guess before that, how does the C matrix change? So in general, right, this matrix, the, uh, the blue unit vectors are going to change with respect to the red unit vectors. And that change happens according to the angular velocity vector. So we eventually got down to this ODE here. It's a matrix ODE. And it's shorthand for nine scalar ODEs. It says how the matrix C changes with time if you have some angular velocity vector that's also changing with time. So you write, you have that angular velocity vector, you write it in terms of the B frame components, that's what gave us omega, and then you use it to populate this omega tilde matrix, which is a, it's a skew symmetric matrix up here, right there in the upper right. So you could write nine scalar ODEs for how this changes, but that's not what's typically done. What's typically done is we first want to represent the C matrix in terms of a smaller set of numbers. So instead of nine numbers, right, the nine entries of the matrix, we use these Euler angles, which describe any orientation as a sequence of three pure rotations about axes. And one of the main ones is the yaw pitch and roll, which we eventually said had a specific name it's the three, two, one Euler angles because the first rotation is about the current number three axis, about a yaw angle. And then the second rotation is about the number two axis through a pitch angle. And the third rotation is about the number one axis through a roll ang angle. So we went through that. Each of these pure rotations can be written in terms of these M matrices on the right. M sub I means a rotation through the number i axis through whatever angle you're given. And at the end of that calculation, the product of those three matrices is another way to write the C matrix, the rotation matrix. And we said that there are 12 different Euler angle conventions written in terms of what the first axis is, the second and the third. And all of the conventions, the the C matrix is written in Appendix B of the book. So we mentioned the 321. Also, there's the 313, which is used as part of orbital elements, longitude of the ascending node, inclination of an argument of periapsis, actually describe the orientation of the, the orbital plane compared to some inertial plane in terms of three angles. And first a rotation about the number three axis, then the number one, and then number three. But there's a problem with Euler angles. So there's other parameters that eventually get used. Um, and this problem is that they have geometric singularities. It's always with the number two angle. You know, there's, there's two, there's three uh, rotations that we do. The singularity is always some particular angle that gives a problem in the number two angle. So theta two. For the three, two, one convention, it's theta two, the pitch is plus or not minus 90 degrees or plus or minus pi over two. In which case there's, some, there's ambiguity in what the roll and the yaw are. So 
there are some orientations where you can't uniquely describe those orientations in terms of Euler angles. So that could be a problem if you have something that could be orienting any which way. So eventually we'll get to other things like quaternions and Euler parameters, which don't have this problem. And we'll see where that problem shows up in what's called the kinematic differential equation. So that's what we'll talk about today. All right, so this is the, we're continuing with rigid body kinematics, but specifically the kinematic differential equation for Euler angles. When we describe rigid bodies, you typically describe their the translational motion and the rotational motion. For the translational motion, you pick some reference point on the body or in the body. Often it's the center of mass, doesn't have to be. And you write, okay, what's the location of that center of mass? So some position vector. And then how does that position vector change? We would often write this vector C, I mean RC, location of the center of mass in terms of end frame components. So this would be X, Y, Z. And let's say all of these are changing in time. So this is changing in time. Then the way that we would write how are X, Y, and Z changing, we've got the inertial derivative of the vector RC, and that'll give us X dot, Y dot, Z dot, right? time rate of change of all of those. And this equals whatever the velocity is. Maybe I'll write the velocity this way. Here's the inertial velocity of the center of mass at a given moment. So this is a vector and it's got three components. So we could either write it as, okay, here's the vector and write it with respect to the end frame or in terms of components, the velocity in the uh, X direction, velocity in the Y and velocity in the Z. And these are all changing in time. Possibly. Now you don't often think about it, but what does this look like? If we write it out, there's an implied identity matrix it's in the front. Vx, Vy, Vz. I always remind myself what frame I'm in. So this would be the, the translational kinematic differential equation. And we, I mean, we often don't even write this identity matrix because it's a waste of time. It's the identity matrix. So this is the translational kinematic, kinematic differential equation. Right, and where do the Vs come from? The way the V changes in time comes from translational dynamics. So from F equals MA, Newton's second law. Let's leave that for now. Let's just say, okay, if I wanted to, if I know how V is changing with time, and I wanted to reconstruct what the position of my rigid body is, so you know the path that it's taking, then I would integrate this set of kinematic differential equations. And the reason I'm emphasizing there's this three by three identity matrix is because when we go over to Euler angles, instead of there being an identity matrix here, there's something else. So if we've got, um, for rotational kinematics. So the rotational kinematic differential equation, if we write the orientation of this body, so remember what the orientation is, you've got some body fixed frame, like that blue frame attached to the body. We write how that's oriented with respect to the inertial frame. So it's like you line up the frames exactly right on top of each other and then calculate this cosine matrix or the Euler angles. In terms of Euler angles, let's say the three, two, one. So yaw pitch and roll. You'll get a kinematic differential equation that looks like this. So time rate of change of yaw, time rate of change of pitch, time rate of change of roll. Those aren't really written with respect to any particular frame, so I don't even have to put a little vector thing on it. But there will be a three by three matrix here that is going to be a function of the um, Euler angles. So for now, I'll just put in 
stars to represent that those are components. This matrix, in the terminology of the book, it calls this matrix B. So this matrix B, each of the entries is going to be a function of the Euler angles. So we could say this matrix B is a function of uh, yaw, pitch, and roll times Instead of translational velocity, that's what V is, this is the rotational or angular velocity. So we'll have omega one as a function of time, omega two as a function of time, omega three. Everything is changing the time. So if I were to emphasize that over here, right, this yaw pitch and roll, everything's changing the time. And just like before, where you get the how is the velocity changing? It comes from translational dynamics. How is the angular velocity changing? That comes from rigid body dynamics, which will be the subject of the next chapter. So this, right for right now, we'll say this B matrix is unknown and we wanna find out what it is. And we always write, um, th this is, these are the components of the angular velocity vector written in the B frame. So if I were to go back up here and write the angular velocity, that's the angular velocity of the B frame with respect to the N frame. And we always write it in terms of B frame components. And in general, those will change in time due to whatever the moments are and other things. Okay. so. Let's find out what's this unknown B matrix. And it's gonna be different for each of the 12 Euler angle conventions. The, we'll, we'll focus on yaw, pitch, and roll. The B matrices are listed in appendix B of the book for all of the different 12. But it's, it's probably useful to just start with yaw, pitch, and roll. So what is, what is the B matrix? The way we get at this is we look at the, the Euler angle sequence of rotations. And for each individual rotation, we can write the angular rate. It'll be the time rate of change of one of those Euler angles and a direction. So an axis of rotation, right? For yaw, pitch, and roll, uh, this is the three, two, one Euler angle sequence or Euler angle convention. So the first one, you think of that initially the two frames are aligned, right? So we've got the inertial frame and the body fixed frame. You think of those as initially aligned. So that I've, these are as aligned as I'm going to be able to do it. B1, B2, B3, N1, N2, N3. And then the first rotation is about the number three axis, the number three axis through an angle phi, which means we're going from here to, to what we rotate. Um, through some angle, uh, not phi, psi. So that means, let me try to sketch this. Those end directions will just always be staying the same. But this new B directions, I'll call this B1 prime, B2 prime. And the number three direction did not change. This angle is psi, psi, right? So we did a rotation through a yaw angle. If we were to write this as a angular velocity, we did the angular velocity from the, um, I guess we could call this the B prime frame from the N frame. And so this is just one simple rotation. So we write the time rate of change of that angle 
psi dot, and then the direction is, we could either write it as B3 or N3. I mean, B3 prime, I'll write it as B3 prime. And we may also wanna remind ourselves from last time, how are these directions, B1, B2, B3, how are they related to the N directions? It's a clockwise, uh, no, counterclockwise rotation. It's positive rotation in the sense of the right-hand rule about the number three axis. So we had cosine uh, psi, sine psi, negative sine psi, cosine psi, zero, zero, one times, I'll use the right colors here, n1, n2, n3. We're going to need this because we're going to have to keep track of what these angles are eventually. Okay, so that's the first rotation. What's the next rotation? The next rotation is we rotate about the new number two direction. What's the new number two direction? It's this one here, B2 prime. We're gonna rotate about that direction through an angle theta, the pitch angle. For this second rotation, I'll try to write B1 prime here. B2 prime, B3 prime, and we're going to a new set of directions. Uh, so we're rotating about this axis. The positive sense is given by the right-hand rule, so my thumb points in the direction of that B2 prime axis. My fingers are curling in the direction of that theta is increasing. So what does that mean? Um, we'll call this B2, uh, sorry, B3 prime prime. So we've rotated through an angle theta there and there'll be, this will also rotate through an angle theta. So it'll be B1 prime prime. That's our new B1 direction. So this is the second rotation about the new number two axis, which is B2 prime. It's also equal to, since we didn't change, B2 double prime, B2 double prime. And that's through an angle theta. I'll keep track of these. What's the angular velocity? The angular velocity going from the B prime frame the B double prime frame. This is theta dot. It's the angular rate of rotation. And then the axis, we could either write it as B2 prime or B2 double prime. We'll write B2 double prime. And then again, to remind ourselves, how are the B double prime directions related to the B prime directions? I need to do a rotation matrix. So this is B1 double prime B2 double prime, B3, double prime equals, it's gonna be some three by three matrix times the B1 prime, B2 prime, B3 prime. And this is a pure rotation about the number two direction. And this one, you, I usually just have to look it up. It's cosine, negative sine, uh, down here will be sine, and then cosine. So good, we've got that. The last one, the third and last rotation is about the new number one axis, which is this B1 double prime direction. So we'll do a rotation, again, in the positive sense, it'll be my thumb pointing in B1 double prime, fingers curling in the direction of the roll angle, phi. So let me see if I can draw this down here reliably. This is B1 double prime, and I've got B3 double prime, and over here, B2 double prime. These don't look very 3D anymore. We're rotating about that direction through an angle phi. So what does that mean? That means, uh, let me write it this way. Here's my angle phi, and We've rotated now, I won't put any primes on these because these represent the actual 
body directions, B1, B2, B3. So we've got that. And then this one has also rotated V. Oh, this is looking complicated now, B2. And then this is direction B1. So we'll just leave that as it is. So third and final rotation about the new number one axis, which is B1 double prime, but that's also equal to just B1. And this is through an angle V. So if we were to write what the angular velocity is, this goes from the B double prime to the B frame. The angular velocity for just that rotation would be V dot. And then I could either write B1 double prime or B1. Well, I'm just going to write B1. For completeness, we could write what the relationship is between the B unit vectors, B1, B2, B3, and the B double prime unit vectors. B1 double prime, B2 double prime, B3 double prime. This is a pure rotation about the number one direction. And this is cosine phi, sine phi, negative sine phi, cosine phi. Okay, cool. Now the total angular velocity will be what? The total angular velocity. Now we use the velo angular velocity addition formula. So the total angular velocity is the angular velocity in going from the, the N frame to the B frame or B frame with respect to the N frame. And we just add all of these individual uh, angular velocities up. So we would have angular velocity of B with respect to B double prime plus angular velocity of B double prime with respect to B prime. What color did I do the first one? Just black B prime with respect to N. You add all those up and what do you get? Well, this is phi dot B1. What's this one? This one was uh, theta dot B2 prime prime plus psi dot B3 prime. I guess I did this one in blue. So just for completeness, let's write it in blue. There we go. Okay, now we've got the, ang the total angular velocity back. Before we've just called this omega. Omega is omega, the B frame with respect to the N frame. And we wanna write that, we want this in terms of just the B frame components. So instead of having these double primes and everything, these sort of intermediate, rotation directions. We want to write B2 double prime and B3 prime in terms of the B1, B2, and B3 directions. So this is what we want. We want something in the B1 direction plus something in the B2 direction plus something. So these little parentheses with stars stand for, okay, we want to put something in, in that form, which means we're going to have to rewrite B3 prime and b2 double prime. How do we do that? Let's start with b equals, so we're talking about this one here. This is actually a pure rotation about the number one direction through an angle phi times the b double prime directions. Now to get the b double prime directions in terms of the b directions, we can take the transpose because the transpose is the inverse of the matrix. So if we take, uh, we can get B double prime equals M1 phi T. T here means transpose times the B directions. And what is, it's easy to take the transpose of a matrix. So then we'll get, you know, B1, double prime, B2, double prime, B3, double prime. I take the transpose of this matrix up here and it looks like I just move a, a, a negative sign right there from that one to the one on the opposite side of the diagonal. Okay, I can do that. Cosine phi, 
negative sine phi, uh, sine phi, cosine phi, V1, V2, V3. And all I want is the V2 double prime component. So if I solve this out, I get B2 double prime equals um, cosine phi times B2 minus sine phi B3, right? So then I, I would substitute what I have into here and now I'm on my way because now I've got things in terms of the B directions, not B prime, not B double prime. Okay, what about this one? This B3 double prime, we can do that. Um, what was this? The, uh, where was it? Yeah, I'll rewrite this. All right, what was this? Pure rotation about the number two direction through an angle theta. So I'm gonna rewrite this, but in the, the shorthand form, so that would be B double prime, the vectrix equals M2 times the B prime vectrix. Right, that comes from that second rotation. This is M2 theta. I don't know if I wrote that one in a particular color. No, okay. B prime. And then what do I get? I could write this as B equals um, pure rotation through phi times pure rotation about the number two axis through theta times um, B prime. And if I wanna get the B prime directions, then I just, I, I'm taking the transpose of this equation so the transpose of that will give me m2 theta. Right, when you take the transpose, you reverse the order. m1 uh, phi transpose times b. And then I can work out what that matrix multiplication gives me, uh, at least for the, the only component I care about, which is b3. So this gives b3 prime is equal to negative sine theta B1 plus sine phi cosine theta B2 plus cosine phi cosine theta B3. So that's, let me put a box around these two because then I'm just substituting back into this equation up here. So, Omega, which was omega B frame with respect to the N frame is going to equal, and now I'm, I'm going to group them as everything that's in the B1 direction, everything in the B2 and everything in the B3. I get negative sine theta times V dot, sorry, psi dot plus V dot, that's in the B1 direction, plus sine phi cosine theta, psi dot plus cosine phi theta dot. That's all in the B2 direction. And then cosine phi cosine theta uh, psi dot minus sine theta, sine phi theta dot B3. All right, and then just identifying what these components are. This is the component of omega in the B1 direction. So this is just omega one. This is the component of omega in the B2 direction. So it's omega two. This is the component of omega in the B3 direction. So it's omega three. So I could summarize this in matrix form and it's also tiring writing all those sines and cosines. So I'll just use shorthand. Yeah, this shorthand over here, this is just, you know, S is gonna be sine C is gonna be cosine. If we were to summarize this, we have omega one, omega two, omega three, 
and we remind ourselves these are the B frame components and this equals, uh, we're gonna write this as some three by three matrix times the time rates of change of the Euler angles, psi dot or time rate of change of yaw, theta dot, time rate of change of pitch, phi dot, time rate of change of roll. And in here, this is negative S theta and then zero and one. I'm just sort of rewriting that component up there. Now I'll rewrite component omega two, sine phi cosine theta, which will be times psi dot, and then cosine phi times theta dot and then zero. And then this last one, this is negative what sine phi and zero. We're almost there. We've got this relationship where we've said, okay, here's the omega vector. It's this weird matrix. It's a function of the Euler angles time the Euler angle rates of change. And this was just for one of the 12 Euler angle conventions. So remember, so this isn't what you would get for all of the Euler angle conventions. This is just for the yaw pitch and roll. Three, two, one. Sometimes people write it not in terms of the number, but in terms of uh, the letter. So they would call this the Z, Y, X. So you might see that it means the same thing. Also, there's no uh, binding rule that you have to call the first angle yaw. That's just a, another common convention. Or that you even have to label it psi. So to, if I were to summarize this in shorthand, I would call this vector, it's usually written as a theta, but as a vector, and it's the time rate of change. So we define this theta vector, and it's just made up of the three angles. The first angle that you rotate through, theta one, the second, and then the third, which for three, two, one, this is psi theta phi, okay. And then this matrix, the book calls this the B matrix. Uh, actually, this is the inverse of the B matrix. Inverse of the matrix. And since it depends on the Euler angles, we say it's a function of this theta vector. And then what is this? Well, this is the, probably the easiest one to write. This is omega the vector, but written in terms of the B frame. That's sort of the compact way that we could write this. Omega equals B inverse times time rate of change of the Euler angles. People who are brand new to rigid body dynamics sometimes think this vector, the time rate of change of the Euler angles equals the angular velocity. And this exercise is meant to show you that no, it's not. There's this weird matrix. And that's just life. If you went from the Euler angle rates of change to the angular velocities, but often it goes the other way. We want to write what are the Euler angle rates of change? Well, we just multiply both of these equations by the B matrix. And B times B inverse disappears. So here's the B matrix times omega. So these are this would be the one that I would call the kinematic differential equation. I guess we could say it's the rotational kinematic differential equation written in terms of Euler vector, uh, Euler angles. All right. And uh, what's what I'm not showing here is there's always going to be something out in front. So B theta for example, we'll have something like one over sine theta two times some stuff. This is just an example. So if we had this, then we'd say, oh, this matrix numerically blows up at theta two goes to zero, meaning it has a singularity just because of this term. Blows up, blows up just means it goes to infinity as theta two goes to zero. And that's not good for any kind of numerical implementation. If you're trying to come up with some automated algorithm, 
And so this is one of the, the well-known problems with the Euler angles. When things go to infinity, that's also called a singularity. So that is, um, it has a singularity. So it's not well behaved at all angles. If you, for whatever reason, know, oh, I'm always going to avoid theta two equals zero or anything close to zero, then okay, fine. But you don't know that. Let me show you these Euler angle conventions. So the appendix B has the direction cosine matrices C and either in the same appendix or a nearby one, it has the B matrices and also the inverse for each of the conventions. So we've been looking at three, two, one, right? The yaw pitch and roll. So notice what this has. This one has a, um, the B matrix look like that. It actually has a one over cosine theta two, which means this thing has a singularity when theta two is plus or minus pi over two or plus or minus 90 degrees, which is what we expected from before in that little illustration. So this is the B matrix and then this is the B inverse over here. The B inverse is the one that's easier to calculate and then you just get the the inverse of it from uh, procedures for getting the inverse of a matrix. So you have this for all of the conventions. Look, there's there's 313 right up above it. Appendix of uh, Schaub and Junkins has B and B inverse for all the conventions. This here over here was just for an example. For all 12 Euler angle sets. And I don't know um, the details of why you would pick one set versus another, because you might wonder why are there 12? Am I only gonna use yaw, pitch, and roll? There may be some cases where one of them makes sense, but I don't have an answer for that right now. We can look at these further. I don't know what this is. These are three nonlinear ODEs, right? We're, we're writing a, like a, a matrix ODE or a vector. ODE, but this represents three nonlinear ordinary differential equations, one for each of the Euler angles and how they change with time. And like I said, they have they all have problems with singularities. This sort of shows you this is not the same as this B matrix is not the identity. So if we were to compare, I'm going to sneak up to the top up, up here. where I think it's useful to compare translational kinematic equations, which are really simple. It's the translational kinematic equation, if we write it in vector form, is just like RC dot equals BC. That's super easy. It's not so easy for Euler angles. Um, unfortunately, you have this, so now we've, we've called this, what, theta dot, and we've got this as the omega vector. There's always this B matrix that isn't constant. It's not the identity. The entries are all changing in time and functions of Euler angles. Oh, wow. And they're nonlinear. And they have the problem of singularities. Euler angles are a good conceptual tool to first think about how to represent rigid body rotations, but they aren't the, the main one that gets used. So there are this is kind of an aside, but we will get to it. There are alternatives to Euler angles that don't have the singularity problem. Um, and they're based on um, the principal rotation vector. I'm just gonna throw out some names here. It's not like you gotta remember Euler parameters, quaternions. The way these often work is instead of having three, three parameters, any set of three parameters is going to have a singularity. So you have to add a fourth parameter. And so with the sets of four parameters do not. Quaternions, as you might see from the name, quaternions, quaternion, they've got four parameters. So these are used and they don't have the singularity problem. If we were to summarize what we've got for the rotational kinematic differential equations so far. The purpose is to go from 
the something you get from dynamics, which is how the angular velocity, go from the angular velocity, which in general will be changing in time to the current uh, attitude orientation, which we've written as the matrix C. So there's, so far we've talked about two ways to do that. You could write the matrix differential equation for C, and that'll be something that uh, looks like that. These are nine linear ODEs, which means they're not as hard to deal with. Or we've got now this other way, I guess uh, written it a few times now. Maybe this seems more straightforward. Three nonlinear ODEs. And from this, right, you would find out how do the thetas change in time. So this gives how theta, I'll write it this way for sort of a general set. Once you know how those thetas change in time, then you could reconstruct the matrix, the rotation matrix C, because C is a function, can be written as a function of those. Then you've got the current orientation. There are other approaches too. So that what I talked about here was from section, if you're looking to read section 3.3. We're now gonna talk about section 3.4, which introduces the principal rotation vector and this thing called Euler's principal uh, rotation theorem. The B matrix isn't orthogonal, no. Yeah, that's why, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. That's why uh, B inverse is not the same as B transpose. The C matrix is orthogonal because it, it's a rotation, but this thing B is not a rotation. I don't even know what it is. It might not be any kind of special matrix at all, but yeah, good question. All right, in the last uh, 15 minutes, I'll talk about the principal axis and angle. These alternatives I talked about up, up here, alternatives to Euler angles that don't have the singularity problem, they're all based on this thing called the principal rotation vector or the axis, um, I sometimes call it the axis angle. Let's talk about that. So this is the principal rotation vector. Maybe let's think of it this way. We're going to start with this way of writing the angular or the um, the kinematic differential equation for the rotation matrix C. In some sense, this is the most fundamental one. This one will not steer you wrong because it's uh, it doesn't have any singular singularity problems. So this is the most fundamental kinematic differential equation of rotation. Maybe I'll just. Uh, that's hard to write. So write KD kinematic differential of equation of rotation. We can com we can combine. Um, well, first let me mention Euler's theorem. It's sometimes called Euler's rotation theorem or Euler's principal rotation theorem. The idea is that you could go from any frame to any other frame. You can go from, you could write a rotation. I'll use the, the typical colors I've been using. You can write the rotation going from everything's aligned. So the blue and the red, the end frame and the B frame being aligned to the B's current orientation. Instead of writing that as a sequence of three rotations, you could just write it as one rotation about some special direction. So there's some special direction. You write it as a unit vector, E. So that special direction, there's just one rotation and uh, it's through that special direction E or about that special direction E through an angle capital Phi. I've said the essence of the theorem, any rotation matrix from the, and I'm writing the end frame, but it's any frame to um, any other frame, right? It's just a triad of unit vectors can be written as a single rotation about a unit uh, vector E through an angle 
capital fee. And these are sometimes called the principal axis and principal angle. It's somewhat hard to illustrate. I, I couldn't find anything online actually. Uh, but if I have, if I wanna write, I've got these two frames oriented in some just kind of random way. There is some special direction. I'll use the orange vector here. And to go from red to blue, all I needed to do was rotate about that one special direction. So one rotation through some, about some special angle through some special, uh, about some special axis through some special angle. And that's the theorem that Euler derived. Euler did a lot. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. So we can combine these into a special vector. Maybe we'll, we'll wait on that. The interesting thing about this E direction is that it has the same components in both the B and the N frame. This principal axis, we could write it as E B1 in the B1 direction plus E B2 in the B2 direction plus E B three, the B three direction. We could also write it in the um, N direction, E N two in the N two direction plus E N three in the N three direction. And it turns out the components are equal. So that means E B sub I equals E N sub I. So we don't even have to put the B, we'll just write these as E sub I. So it's the, so this hopefully makes sense. It's the one direction because you're rotating about it, anything along there uh, won't change. The E directions equals this C matrix times the E directions or those E components, it doesn't change. If you recall eigenvalues and eigenvectors, then this looks like we took the matrix C multiplied by some direction, and then we have one times E. So E is the eigenvector. I mean, we should emphasize, we have to normalize this. It's a unit vector. It's the normalized eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue plus one of C. So you can find the, you can find this E direction by finding, calculating the eigenvalues of C. There's always going to be an eigenvalue one and there'll be a corresponding eigenvector for any matrix, any rotation matrix. So that's kind of cool. How does this get used? We can use this by combining the E direction and this angle um, into a common vector. So combine the axis, it's just a unit vector, and the angle into one vector, which I'll write as gamma. So if we combine these, this is the principal rotation vector, write it this way. And we can show, so this is the principal rotation vector. When omega is fixed, in a direction in space, it turns out the derivative of this principal rotation vector equals omega. So now this is almost looking like the simple translational kinematic ODE. So, so that's good. There's something, there's something good here. So it means there is some special vector whose time rate of change equals the angular velocity. And there's a relationship between the gamma and the C matrix, if we were to put this into, I said was this fundamental kinematic differential equation up here, right? This was negative omega tilde times C. Well, if we were to write this in terms of, you know, using this expression, instead of omega tilde, we could do the derivative of gamma tilde times C. Again, assuming that only the angle is changing, not the axis. And this matrix ODE is solved by, and this is pretty cool, C equals E to the negative gamma tilde. And maybe I'll, I guess I'll write it that way. So this is a matrix exponential. If you haven't seen it, if I have a square matrix A, so let's say E to the A, E to the A will be, and let's say that this is a N by N, matrix, then you write the 
Taylor series expansion as if it were a scalar, but then you put in the matrix. So this is going to be one plus a plus one over two factorial a squared plus one over three factorial a to the cubed and so on. So that's what a matrix exponential is. You could quickly write down what's the rotation matrix in terms of the principal rotation vector. This is just a intro. So for next time, read section 3.4 and we'll say more about this principal rotation vector and maybe get into the other alternatives to the Euler angles that come from this. So that principal rotation vector is important. So I'll stop there. I see some questions. Uh, the expansion would stop at end. No, no, it keeps on going. So this is an infinite series, just like with any Taylor series. It turns out though, if A has a special form, then it will truncate at some point. Uh, what does the tilde mean? Tilde, oh, well, if you don't remember, if we have a three vector, I'll call it A, then the A tilde, you make a three by three matrix with entries of A. So if A is, has entries A1, A2, A3, it's a three vector, then this is negative A3, A2, negative A1, A1, negative A2, A3. If you remember, I think it was like either lecture two or lecture three, this came from, if you write, a cross B. So if you want to write the cross product, you could actually write the cross product as a matrix multiplication. So it'd be this A tilde cross B. So that's where it comes from. So yeah, it's kind of weird. Why does this, this matrix that has to do with cross products uh, show up? And what's it doing in a matrix exponential?